And good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the Employment Law Update with What's New in 2022. We have longtime attorneys for Buckley Law, Jillian Pollock and William Garr with us this morning. We would like to open up if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can wait till the end of the program to ask, the, ask our attorneys directly. With that, I am pleased to turn this over to Jillian and to Bill Garr. So we will do just a quick background on each of us. Um, I've been practicing law since the late 80s. Um, Jillian and I are uh, the sort of heads of the employment department at Buckley Law, and we've been working together um, for over 10 years. Uh, we are business lawyers, and more exclusively, we, we do employer-related work. We don't do plaintiff's cases. Um, we do some high-level executive agreements, um, but the standard run-of-the-mill Plaintiff's work is not um, what our firm does. Our firm is really a business-oriented firm. Um, I come out of a litig litigation background, um, was a public defender for six years in the Tri-County area um, for one of the largest criminal defense firms where I uh, tried, I don't know, more cases than I can count, um, and then moved into employment law in the mid-90s uh, mid and have um, been doing that type of work and business litigation ever since, and I have the absolute joy uh, um, and privilege of working with my partner Jillian um, for the last, like I say, 10, 12 years, I forget. I've been around here, I think, too long. Um, but I'll let you, Jillian, you talk a little bit about yourself. And if you don't brag enough about you, I'm going to come back in and brag about you. So. Oh, thank, thank you, Bill. Um, I've been practicing law since the early part of the 2000s. I started in Washington State, uh, where I practiced for about five or six years. And then I moved back to Portland, which is my hometown, um, and joined Buckley Law in the late 2000s, um, about 2008, I think. Um, and I've been working with Bill, as he said, for about the past 10 years. Um, in our employment practices group. Um, love our work. Um, it's just a, it's an extremely interesting area. It's very varied, lots of changes, lots of new laws um, happening all the time in the employment world. So it, it um, definitely keeps us busy. Um, and I'm just grateful to the chamber for giving us the opportunity to speak to you today about some changes that have happened this year and, and so a couple more recent changes that have happened in the past year or two, but are also very important. So thank you very much for this opportunity. So consistent with the way Jillian and I run our practice um, and Buckley Law runs his practice is really we try to do a lot of preventative work. Um, we do a lot of litigation, but um, we probably also do almost as much um, daily advice, uh, and what we're about to get into today is all about that daily advice that keeps the business healthy, keeps um, your employment um, settings with all of your labor capital, as I call them, all of your staff, um, in, um, I guess, in a, in a good way, um, keeps your corporate culture running correctly, and when you, you're aware of what the laws are that are coming at you and that exist around you, um, it helps businesses avoid getting into uh, areas that can then lead to ultimately litigation, which is I continually tell my clients, it's a rat hole for your money. So if you can stay out of that, um, you're, you're better off. So moving into the slides, the way we'll do this today, Jillian and I are going to just sort of tag team on the slides. I'm going to let First start off, and if you have a question, um, feel free to make this an interactive process, especially with the small group. Um, be quite honest, I wouldn't even mind if you unmuted yourself and just asked the question, um, since there's a small group, if you would prefer to type it into the uh, question, we'll pick it up that way as well. So Jillian, let's get started. Sure, I'll start with just a broad overview of where we are with COVID. Um, 
as of today, the governor's uh, emergency declaration is going to end effective April 1st. Uh, the last time I checked was yesterday afternoon and it's still April, April 1st. Um, there's always, of course, the possibility that she will declare an earlier end um, or, or extend it depending on what happens in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but for right now, the emergency declaration will end on April 1. As I think we all know, the indoor mask mandate ended this past Saturday, and Bill is going to speak on what that means for employers um, and the use of masks in the workplace. Just a quick overview on vaccine mandates and where we are. Um, on the federal level, um, there was a large employer vaccine mandate that would have affected very large employers. Um, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court um, blocked that vaccine mandate. It is not going into effect. Um, there is a mandate, a vaccine mandate that affects contractors and subcontractors with contracts with the federal government. There have been a number of courts that have issued stays preventing that vaccine mandate from going into effect. In the current status, it is it, it stayed. It's not being enforced at this time. That could, of course, change. Um, there is a um, mandate for folks who work in Medicare and Medicaid facilities, uh, healthcare workers, that is in effect. And the Supreme Court has looked at that mandate and has determined that it passes legal muster. Um, for Oregon State, we just have mandates affecting healthcare workers, folks who work in the executive branch of government, and folks who um, work in, or in, and I believe also volunteer in uh, K through 12 in our public school system. Um, employers, um, there are a number of employers that have adopted vaccine mandates in the workplace. Uh, Nike is a good example. They've been in the news over the past several weeks with respect to their vaccine mandate. Uh, and so far, um, courts have been finding that those ma uh, mandates in the workplace are legitimate, good business purpose for those, uh, as long as there's a recognition that uh, there may be a need for a, a reasonable accommodation for um, religious purposes or for folks who have medical conditions or disabilities. I'll let Bill worth, and speak to. And worth noting on that uh, vaccine mandate, one of the original um, fact patterns Jillian and I were looking at on a required mandate is uh, whether or not um, if an employee was not you know, refusing to be vaccinated for uh, religious accommodation reasons or a medical reason, would that create um, a health and safety issue for the other workers? And what was the accommodation? And I, I think the uh, at the end of the day, with the degree of um, vaccination, the degree, degree of herd immunity, the science that seems to be behind where we are in this state, um, employers would have a difficult time arguing that the um, employee who is not vaccinated uh, poses a specific threat to the other employees. And that's still a fact-based conversation um, based on science, but it's one that's going to be harder and harder to make the further and further we get down the road towards both either it's immunity or people who have contracted COVID um, and have antibodies in them. So uh, again, the safety and health issue, um, according to recent CDC guidelines and Oregon Health Authority guidelines, um, the safety issue is starting to lower, which is of course why we're in uh, the um, removal of the um, removal of the mask mandate, which gets us to talking about masks and whether or not employers can still require employees to wear masks at work. And much like the um, 
a vaccine mandate, the idea is yes, you can. Um, there are always issues associated with whether an individual who is wearing a mask, and Jillian and I saw a handful of these, um, is those of you who wear glasses, as you can see, I do. Um, the masks were a big issue. I had actually had to figure out how to wear glasses and masks because I was constantly fogging up my glasses. Um, there are other issues associated with people being claustrophobic and, and concerns that were medical and people required accommodations. Um, and the employers worked through those um, we actually dealt with one employee who was terminated uh, as a result of refusing to wear the, the shield because it affected her vision and she was in a medical setting and she said, I couldn't do my job because I can't see. And uh, actually the end result of that case is we pulled in some uh, doctors and some science and some technology and offered the employee her job back. And she came back to work um, because there was an easy way to reasonably accommodate that specific employee. But um, those issues do come up. So yes, you can require your employees to wear a mask, but you don't have to. Buckley Law is um, back open. Um, we are not masking. However, there are individuals within the office who are uncomfortable with that decision and they continue to remain masks. And we've made it very clear to everybody, you should be absolutely comfortable if you wanna wear a mask. We are, um, while we're open to the public and not mandating masks, um, we are telling our clients if they have concerns relating to a mask um, that you want us to wear them or you need to wear them. We have masks still available at the front desk. Um, and we continue to recognize that there is, uh, I, I will call it just a, a social issue, less than a legal issue surrounding the mass. It's the politics, but also people are just concerned about it. Some people also are immunocompromised and need the mask. And so for those reasons, um, yes, you should allow your individual employees to wear a mask. Um, and the accommodation issues come up again, both from claustrophobia, uh, social distancing is one of the ways to accommodate somebody who um, is uncomfortable in a setting where they think that um, COVID is available and that others should be wearing a mask. But if an employee is suggesting that everybody should continue to wear a mask, the employers are not obligated to do that. And I think that the um, science is leading us to believe that um, it is a safer environment um, and the employees can, you're, you're not violating the safety and health issue under state or federal ADAs. Anything on that slide, Jillian? No, I think we're ready to move on to some other workplace requirements. Um, so as it stands, it is no longer necessary to keep that six feet of distance between employees in the workplace, except for particular settings, most notably healthcare settings. It's also no longer mandatory to um, conduct those regular cleaning and sanitations of workplaces, except for again in the healthcare setting. Um, as you may recall, uh, this was towards the end of 2020, I believe, the Oregon um, Occupational Safe and Healthy Administration uh, issued regulations requiring most employers to conduct a risk assessment mm -hmm. uh, relating to COVID in the workplace. Employers were supposed to go through and determine what risk levels they had with COVID in their workplace. They were to come up with an infection control plan and also provide some infection control training to employees. Those rules are currently still in place. We have had some indication that Oregon OSHA will um, look at those rules and, and it, it, I anticipate that we may see some changes in the next few weeks as, as we move out of the emergency um, orders issued by the governor. Exactly. 
Um, on the um, exposure rules, the idea of if someone's been exposed, there is still um, a requirement that if you've been exposed, um, there is social distancing that still applies, which is uh, six feet. Um, if you're around somebody who's been exposed, the quarantine and social distancing pieces apply there. If you've been subjected to secretions um, related to or come in contact with someone who is positive. Um, the isolation requirements in place are five days post onset of symptoms um, and, and 24 hours free of uh, fever. So if you're at day seven and you still have a fever, you haven't reached the and portion, you got to go another 24 hours. Um, if you are hospitalized or immunocompromised or have underlying exposure, it's actually 10 days if you have symptoms or test positive. And the mask requirements are no longer, however, um, or OHA, the health authority, is recommending that you mask for 10 days after onset um, or uh, positive tests. So it's not required, it's recommended, um, and it depends on what you uh, want to be doing within your, within your workforce with your employees. Hi. I think we're ready to move on to the next slide. Yeah, we've touched that. So there's OFLA. So the Oregon Family Leave Act is a leave act that is modeled on the Federal Family Medical Leave Act. It allows certain eligible employees to take protected leave uh, for various reasons, most notably if they have a serious health condition uh, that they need to have treated. Uh, they can take either a block of leave or intermittent leave for that treatment, or if they have a family member who has a serious health condition and they need to um, participate in that person's care, um, they can take leave for that. There, there are a number of reasons an individual could take OFLA leave. Um, very importantly, it is an act that only applies to employers with 25 or more employees. The federal act only applies to employers with 50 or more employees. So neither act applies to very smaller employers. OFLA was um, modified by the Oregon legislature um, in three particular ways. First, if there is a public health emergency declared by the governor of the state of Oregon, such as our current COVID-19 public health emergency, employees become eligible for OFLA leave for any purpose um, after working for the employer for 30 days, and the employee needs to work a minimum of 25 hours per week. This is significantly shorter than the standard period, which is 180 days of employment, working a minimum of 25 hours per week. And this only applies during periods when there is a public health emergency. So once the public health emergency order is lifted on April 1st of this year, this will not apply unless of course there's another subsequent declaration of public health emergency. The second major change was the introduction of restoration rights or breaks in service. So if you have an employee who resigns, if their employment is terminated, um, if they are laid off, uh, any break in service, and they are rehired or come back to work within 180 days of that separation date, then all of their OFLA rights are restored. So for instance, um, if you're, you're counting the days towards eligibility and they worked 120 days before they were separated, and they come back a month later, um, then they only have 60 days left to complete in order to become OFLA eligible. If they were eligible for OFLA before the separation and service, 
and they come back within 180 days from that date of separation, then all of their eligibility rights are restored. Uh, and finally, um, and this comes out of COVID as well, um, Oregon Family Leave Act leave can be used by an employee who needs to care for a child who requires care at home because the child's school or daycare has been closed by a public health emergency. Worth adding to this is that um, employers generally say, well, I don't have 25 employees, so that just doesn't apply to me, and they stop listening. Um, Jillian and I do a lot of handbook review and work and drafting, and it is not uncommon that a handbook has been um, pulled from the internet or uh, picked up from uh, someone in HR that you know at another business. And within that handbook is an OFLA section. And the Family Leave Acts are available if you as the employer want to apply them to your employees and you only have five employees. So what happens is you become contractually bound to um, the Family Leave Acts, even though they don't apply to you because you're not a 25 or more or a 50 more or more. So it's super important to be paying attention to what your handbooks say and making sure that when you're implementing those policies that are in your handbook and when you're publishing your handbook to your employees, the, the handbook fits your business size. Um, we sort of run these thresholds of six or more, 15 or more, because federal laws apply 15 or more, 25 or more, um, and then 50 or more. Um, the 25 or more is a, is a critical tipping point because this family leave comes with a lot of administrative work. And you have to pay attention and you can get hamstrung really quickly by either interfering with someone's family leave rights or you terminate someone in a short period of time after they've made a request for family leave rights, even though it's a valid termination and the claim is a retaliation based on access to their um, family leave rights. So you wanna be very careful in your handbook to make sure that you don't have uh, a policy in there that doesn't apply based on the size of your uh, employer. And I would, I would also add that even if OFLA does not apply to your particular business. Uh, an employee may have rights under other laws, such as the Oregon sick time law, um, mm -hmm. or if they have a condition that qualifies as a disability, they may have rights under the either the Federal uh, Disability Act, uh, Americans Dis with Disabilities Act, or the parallel state disabilities law. Um, and uh, at this juncture in the Ninth Circuit where we are located, um, leave from work can be an accommodation for a disability. So something to keep in mind, if an employee who approaches you with a request for leave for um, a condition a medical condition that might be a disability. Absolutely. A new, and it's really not, a, it shouldn't be surprising. And for those of us who practice in this area all the time, um, we've been watching over the last five years, uh, the state of Washington and the state of Oregon slowly uh, restrict an employer's ability to prohibit competition by its uh, former employees. And the state of California has not allowed this for years. Um, the, it's even difficult to say, okay, I've got uh, Delaware Corporation employees in Utah and Idaho and Washington and Oregon, and I'm doing work out of California, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and employ non-competition agreements from these other states because it's legal and the employment agreement for my California people. Um, California is very protective of its workforce and generally as a matter of public policy will tell you those aren't effective. Uh, there are some ways around that, but as a general rule where I'm going with this is that the trend across the country is for non-competition agreements to really only apply to high level individuals who 
have access to significant trade secrets and who then go out and can compete um, unfairly, not on an even, even playing field. Um, my advice when I'm talking to small business as well as large is that most businesses have some form of trade secret, whether it's um, dealing with a small chocolate tree. Um, I've got a new client that's a, a chocolate maker. Their recipes are absolute trade secrets. Um, we have um, insurance companies, insurance salespeople where the uh, book of clients, while the names may be known, the contact information, the buying habits, the size of business, those are all trade secrets. You can protect all of that information through confidentiality, non-solicitation, and trade secret agreements instead of trying to impose um, a, a, a draconian non-competition agreement um, that may not be enforceable. So the law has changed. It's retroactive to Jan 1 of 2022. Um, instead of 18 months, which it used to be available, we're down to 12 months. Uh, the employee at time of termination, his employee, his um, gross salary needs to exceed 10533, and this is going to be adjusted upwardly annually. So in thinking about your startup where somebody's only making, say, $50,000, um, but the business is going to take off and you need them subject to a non-compete within a reasonable geographic scope and within that 12 month time frame to protect them from both soliciting your customers and taking your trade secrets and competing directly in your market share. That individual may be making $250,000, $400,000 by the time they're terminated. So you have to think your way through this. And one of the ways to cover that is to put language in those non-compete agreements that indicate, you know, you need to be exceeding that um, time adjusted uh, gross salary. And if you do not, the non-compete is invalid. Um, State of Washington's got some pretty specific and dangerous language that makes it fully retroactive to the existence of time. Whether, I, whether that's constitutional or not, I've not had a client allow me to take that one up and argue it before the Court of Appeals. But the concept, again, is that um, you have to meet the statutory criteria in Washington, which is, again, these limited um, positions. So if you're contemplating um, needing some protection for your business, um, you've got staff members who are working your clients and maybe they're going to go out. You're afraid they'll go out within the general region and, and open up their own business. Um, generally lock down your, your, your clients and customers and your trade secrets. Um, I was down in Jackson County uh, two weeks ago and was able to get a court to prohibit an agent working in Ashland who was basically taking the book of business that was coming out of Ashland, though it didn't belong to her, and starting her own business and interrupting a sale of the overall business, which was over $3 million. And the court was willing to grant that um, temporary restraining order um, based on trade secrets, not so much based on this competition issue. So again, you know, talk to your business lawyers about how you're gonna protect the privacy of your information and the value of that information so that employees, when they leave, they compete on an even footing instead of taking your store and opening it up right next door to you and undercutting all of the hard work that you did to build um, into that region. Anything, Jillian, you want to add to that? No, I, um, I have nothing to add other than um, litigating non-competition agreements is incredibly expensive. Yeah. Um, and um, I have found in all or almost all of cases um, that a very good non-solicitation and confidentiality provision is, is sufficient to protect the business's interests, so. Yeah, and more inclined to be um, uh, enforced by a judge who sits up there at the end of the day and says, so you want me to like, make it so they can't work or they got to move their whole family out of the school districts and blah, blah, blah. And it just, it's a hard sell. Um, if you're a FLIR executive and you've got the top, um, the, the data for the, and you're an engineer and the top, top chip 
of, of what you're doing there, yeah, the courts are quite happy to enforce those pieces. Um, but again, as Jillian is saying, and I think what our advice generally is, is um, non, uh, non solicitation, non comp, and trade secret prohibitions and protections are really the way to go. Jillian? The Crown Act. Um, that the, the Crown Act is part of a national trend to prevent discrimination um, on the basis of hairstyles and clothing that is associated with a person's race. And this movement started, uh, I think a couple of years ago um, after, and this was in the news, so you may recall it, there was a um, black athlete, a, a wrestler in New Jersey who had long hair, I think it was in braids, and he was forced to cut his hair at a wrestling competition in order to compete. And there was some public outcry after this happened and um, it spurred some legislatures, including now the Oregon legislature to enact, um, make changes to existing anti-discrimination laws so that it is now unlawful to discriminate against employees based on hairstyles associated with race. So that would be, for instance, dreadlocks or um, hair with um, twists or, um, or afros. Um, and um, if you have a dress code policy, uh, you need to take a look at it to make sure that um, there are accommodations for folks who might be members of a protected class. And I think a good example is a lawsuit that was filed in the past, I think three or four years against Abercrombie and Fitch, the clothing store. They hired a young woman, young woman as a sales clerk. She was Muslim. She wanted to wear a hijab at work. Abercrombie refused to allow her to wear her her headscarf at work. She brought a lawsuit saying that she was being discriminated against on the basis of her religion and courts found in her favor. Um, so that would be a, an example of a dress code policy uh, that would be, that would be um, in violation of this particular law. Um, so if you have handbooks or, or policies relating to personal appearance and grooming. Uh, it's a good idea to review those to make sure that they don't have any language in them that would be um, in violation of this law. I, I do a lot of work on handbooks. I have very rarely seen um, hair or dress code policies that would be in violation, but I have seen a few. Um, so it's a, it's a good idea to take a look at those now that this new law is in effect. Um, one last thing is that if you have provisions from your handbooks or policies relating to workplace safety, for instance, if you have um, employees who work around machinery and you have requirements that they pull back their hair when working around machinery or they not wear loose fitting clothing when working with machinery. Those are fine. It's fine to have legitimate safety related requirements for hair and clothing in the workplace. And uh, that goes to requiring people to don safety related um, personal protective equipment over their clothing, um, yes. closed toes, shoes, anything. So, I mean, the, the common sense way to think through it is um, the reason is I'm trying to protect the employee. I'm not um, making a decision based on how this employee is dressed as a general rule. Still doesn't mean you can't require business attire um, in a business setting. It, those get a little closer to the, um, you know, to the firing line. I had a case with the Benson years ago where I was defending the Benson Hotel in a labor arbitration and the a person who was receiving the gas at the, the front desk um, was in violation of 
both the tattoo and ear piercing policies, for some reason, they decided to change their um, appearance. And the union grieved the issue based on back then uh, the violation of the approved uh, dress code. And there really wasn't a tattoo um, policy, but said that should fall within the dress code. And the arbitrator actually allowed, because of the Benson's setting, its unique nature of um, interacting with its clientele, the uh, arbitrator was allowed to articulate a um, dress code uh, that met the needs of the business. And we were able to articulate the reason why having a tattoo up the side of your neck really wasn't appropriate for this individual to work the front desk. Um, so those are the kinds of things you run into um, and you need a fact-based case-by-case uh, um, -case analysis of whether your dress code is appropriate for your specific business. But generally, this is nothing, uh, this shouldn't be a problem. Um, the Oregon Safe Employment Act um, is more something that employment lawyers nerd out about on, and Jillian and I do this kind of stuff. Um, this concept under that bullet point number two creates a rebuttable presumption of discrimination when an employer takes an adverse employment action against an employee within 60 days of the employee uh, um, reporting unsafe conditions or engaging in protected activities. What that really is saying is, did you retaliate against this employee because of this protected status? And I will tell you, even without this law, I would be saying to the employer, especially if we're analyzing the termination and decision prior to implementing it, I always do a historical look. I always ask what's gone on with this employee. Is this employee recently filed a worker's comp claim? If they are covered by OFLA, did they recently file an OFLA claim? Is there a valid wage issue? Is there a concerted action even without a union by a group of people and this is the employee coming forward? Has this person been subjected to sexual harassment and complained about it? Um, all of those issues, I could care less about this rebuttable presumption. It exists when I'm in the courtroom, the jury is there giving that that employee a break. So this is like I say, we kind of nerd out on these things and say it's more of a civil procedure issue in the courtroom on burdens and motions. Um, but the important piece to come out of this is a recognition that if you are disciplining, changing wages, um, taking an adverse employment action against an employee within a short window of time of that employee engaging in a protected status, some kind of protected activity, you need to think twice about it. Doesn't mean don't do it. It means think twice about it. It means pay attention. For example, person made a um, sexual harassment claim and then fell off the dock and has a workers' comp claim and two days later is caught on film with their hand in the till stealing 250 bucks out of your cash register. Can you terminate them for that? Absolutely. You absolutely can. That's the rebuttable presumption that existed before this. That's the reason where a juror's gonna say, okay, really, give me a break. You can't steal from your employer. Unless, of course, you've been keeping all the other employees who were caught stealing, and this one you're singling out. So consistency, fairness, uh, and, 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 and treating the employees consistently really makes a difference. So Oregon Safe Employment Act, um, the real lesson coming out of that one is just remember, if you've got some kind of uh, um, adverse employment action going on, do a historical look as to your discipline and your, act your employment actions. Driver's license as a condition of employment. Uh, this was a new law enacted by the Oregon legislature. It is in effect now. Oregon employers cannot require um, that employees have a valid driver's license um, as a condition of their employment, unless the ability to drive legally is an, is an essential function of their job. It's something they're expected to do as part of their job, or there's a legitimate business purpose for having the requirement. Um, so, this may require some employers to update their job descriptions to include a description as that there is a um, 
that driving is an essential function of the job, or it may require you to employers to look at their job descriptions and they say, no, no, there's not a, um, an obligation to drive as, as part of this job. Um, with I-9s, um, you know, um, employees are permitted to choose from, um, there's different forms of identification that can be shown as part of the I-9 verification process. Employees can still voluntarily choose to use a driver's license as part of that process, uh, but employers cannot require the uh, applicant or the employee to show a driver's license um, for the I-9 process. So basically, um, unless there's a valid reason to require the person to have a driver's license for the essential functions of the job, um, shouldn't ask for it. Um, job applications that uh, require um, employees or applicants to, to write in their driver's license number, those may need to be revised in light of this law. This is a, Jillian's bullet point number three is just a great um, example of how, you know, your employment law practices are all intertwined. And if you look at that, you're updating your job description. The first question you should be asking is, do I have job description for my employees? Um, the reason why it's so important is that everybody's covered by workers' compensation. And if you um, employ light duty, uh, what will happen is the in working with that individual, you'll be looking at the essential functions of the job. You'll be working with the doctor on what it is that the employee can and can't do. If you are involved in any kind of disability or reasonable accommodation analysis, for example, some mask issue or vaccine issue associated with um, a medical condition, again, the courts will assume it's an essential function of the job if you have it in writing. They do not give you that presumption. There's that word again for the employment nerds. You don't get the presumption that it's an essential function unless it's written. And the third and most, I think, important piece when I'm working with my employer clients, whether they're large employer clients that have a mature business or startups that with this you know, um, growth potential that's coming on because they're going to be onboarding a lot of people to be able to manage whatever widgets that they're going to process, you have to look at your jobs, you look at what your structure is and what your employees are. And from that, you have job descriptions. And then it's easier to manage the capital. You manage the human beings as to what it is, who's doing what. If I'm in a RIF situation where I'm reducing force, I can look across the board and analyze my workforce based on essential functions and which functions more likely combine with other jobs so that when I'm collapsing jobs into the other as I have a need for um, downsizing, if that's the case. So again, um, these are great reasons why you have a job description. It forces you to go through a number of sort of stress tests about your business um, so that you know that your the machine you drive down the road is functioning um, on all cylinders and on all wheels. Um, this is a new one, and I do a lot of work in the ag uh, field, both um, uh, largely in the, um, the berry industry, but we have um, some pot clients that are manufacturers as well. And the agricultural workers, um, it appears as though when the overtime exemptions were amended for some reason, and I do not understand why, agricultural workers were left out. The Bureau of Labor and Industries now is saying that it was an oversight. I'm not so sure it was an oversight and was a, um, I don't know, I'd be speculating. But right now what has happened is that the um, legislature has fixed whether it was an oversight or not, and agricultural workers are now subject to, they have to be paid overtime, which is actually a pretty significant uh, move if you are involved in um, any kind of uh, processing and harvesting. And as the seasons come on, um, there are short windows of time for people to be working um, 10 hour days, 12 hour days 
for a limited period of time. So this will impact um, a number of businesses here in Oregon. Um, the definition of an agricultural worker includes really farming activities as well as activities that are incident to that farming activities on the farm or off the farm, meaning that I'm transporting the product to the manufacturing warehouse, or the processing plant, um, anything along those, those lines. So um, right here, we, we don't have a whole, we don't have a whole lot of farmers um, in the suburban vicinity, but um, this does affect the, uh, a lot of businesses here in Oregon. And it's, it is consistent now with Washington and with Oregon. Okay, next we have some proposed rules. These have not been enacted yet. They're still in the proposal stages, um, but they are significant rules and they come out of our, our recent experiences with wildfire smoke and the extreme heat that we experienced, um, gosh, was that last summer? 117 degree days. Um, so Oregon OSHA has proposed a couple of rules to address these extremes. Uh, for wildfire smoke, uh, there's a proposed rule that if the local air quality index in the vicinity in which you um, have your place of employment um, shows that the air quality is unhealthy, then employers will be required to provide N95 respirators to all employees with an exception if the employees are working inside in a workplace that has a filtered climate control system and of course, there's also gonna be, I think, a rule that the employer needs to keep the doors closed uh, to keep the particulates out. Um, if the local air quality index become, reaches a very unhealthy level, then employees that are exposed to that unhealthy air must be provided and must wear NIOSH approved filtering uh, respirators. And if the air quality reaches very unhealthy levels, then employers are going to be required to provide a respiratory protection program. Uh, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, what those requirements will be. Um, there will be a requirement for filter respirators as part of that and must conduct basically safety checks to ensure that respirators and perhaps other equipment are all functioning properly. Um, again, these are proposed rules. They haven't been enacted, but I suspect we'll be seeing yep. something that either matches or is similar to uh, these proposed rules going into effect to protect our workers who are exposed to wildfire smoke. To, to the me to me these rules um, again my ag clients are paying very close attention to them but um, you know when you have the heat rules and the smoke rules and you have manufacturing and uh, Lake Oswego actually is moving into having more industrial lands having more um, manufacturing availability uh, where you have manufacturing that is and that is warehouse based and it isn't necessarily a controlled climate with HVAC um, and temperature, but you have people out in the uh, warehouse and open bays where smoke comes in and heat is coming in, you may have to pay attention to something like this. Um, it, it, it really probably isn't going to apply to the, the standard office worker, the, the people who are running shops and running businesses that have a building that is um, HVAC um, serviced with filtration systems, all that, you're going to be subject to the exemption. But um, employers who are running um, manufacturing, and I can think of a couple clients that are Lake Oswego clients with manufacturing uh, facilities, and those facilities are going to have to be paying attention to these rules as they 
come into play. So again, if that's the kind of employer you are with in the manufacturing world, you do have to start paying attention to these things because I, I will I will guarantee you OSHA is going to do this. Um, of course, I, every time I guarantee something, it probably fails, but I've been putting together comments with OSHA on a number of other issues and we have a, um, uh, a, a very proactive Oregon OSHA. And so we just need to be paying attention to this. These things are going to come into play. They're going to be um, looking to take care of the employees. And so it's going to be added costs and added issues for the employer. And you should be thinking about if this does apply to you somehow, how you're going to manage this. For example, do you think all of those N95 masks or NIOSH approved filtering masks are going to be available if we have the wildfires that we had a couple of years ago? Um, they're not going to be. Um, maybe you have even a resurgence of uh, a COVID variant, God forbid, um, you never know. So advanced thinking um, is again, you know, best laid plans. Last slide. So I'm going to discuss briefly the Oregon Workplace Fairness Act. Uh, this is an Oregon law that actually went into effect uh, back in October of 2020 but it is a significant act. It applies to virtually every Oregon employer. Um, Oregon employers with one or more employees are going to be um, responsible for complying with this act. And so basically it requires most Oregon employers to evaluate their harassment policies. If they have a written harassment policy, if they don't, then they'll need one. Um, but evaluate written harassment policies to make sure that they comply with very specific provisions that are required now under Oregon law. I think we've all seen um, sexual harassment policies that state that you know, this company prohibits sexual harassment, all forms of workplace discrimination. This new law says that you need to say more than that you need to have a written policy um, on how to report misconduct. You need to provide multiple positions that misconduct can report be reported to. Uh, it's, it's insufficient to say it can be reported to um, the director of HR. There, there needs to, it can be direct, um, reported to the director of HR, but you need to have alternates in place that the reports can be made to. Um, there needs to be a statement, um, the statute of limitations under Oregon law to bring a claim. There needs to be definitions of certain types of agreements, um, such as a non-disparagement agreement and, or a uh, no rehire agreement and you need to define those and you need to have an affirmative statement that you will not require as an employer that employees sign a, a non-disparagement uh, agreement or a non-disclosure agreement or a no rehirement agreement um, if they are, for instance, settling a claim that they've been harassed or if you are um, uh, doing a severance, a separation from their employment and you're offering them severance and they're signing a severance agreement. You have to have the statement that, you know, you, you can't require employees to sign a non-disclosure or non-disparagement agreement um, as part of those, you know, severance agreements or se settlement agreements. Uh, however, an employee can voluntarily ask to have such an agreement, a, a non-disclosure or a non-disparagement agreement within their settlement agreement or within their separation agreement. Um, you need to have in your policy, in your harassment policy, um, a recommendation, you know, notice, advising employees to document incidents of sexual harassment or other unlawful discrimination. Um, it's a significant change to the way employers have drafted anti-harassment policies in the past. 
I have reviewed many, many, many harassment policies since this law went into effect. And I think I revised every single one of them in order to comply with this new law because it has such significant requirements that were, were not in place before October 1st of 2020. Um, so not only do, do most employers need to have this written policy, but you need to provide it to employees when they start work, it needs to be made available or posted in the workplace. And if an employee um, makes a report of harassment or unlawful discrimination, a, a copy of this policy must be provided to them at the time they make the report. So not only is there requirements that policies comply with this new law, uh, but there are requirements as to when the policy must be given to employees. So very significant. And with that, we have two minutes to spare. We've come in under the timeline. Um, I would say I'm, we are here for questions. If anybody has any specific questions, go ahead and ask them. Um, you can always email us also after the fact, if you're wandering through your day and thinking about something, it's like, well, they touched on that. I didn't quite understand the ramifications of it. Just write us an email. Um, we're happy to um, talk about and educate um, the chamber members. It's um, a part of the service that we do and it's important to us for the, for the membership. So Liz, thank you as always for having us and allowing us to, um, to participate and educate. We appreciate your time. And on behalf of the chamber, we thank you, Bill Gar and Jillian Pollock for being willing to make this presentation today and to allow us to record it. And special thanks to Amber White for putting the arrangements together. Buckley Law is a visionary member and you can hear from this presentation that they definitely are looking towards the future of businesses and for business success. With that, I want to thank you very much and do encourage you folks, if you would like to ask questions, do email Bill and Jillian, and we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You bet. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week. You as well. Thank you for the presentation. All right.